Hello, Ansh. This is David. Um, I am responding to your email in terms of a, in terms of a video fashion, rather than me just writing it to you. I think it'll be just easier for me to just walk walk with you through the questions. So let me just start off with this gear question. Okay. So um, what I'm gonna do here is I am going to just take a little screenshot of this and then just work on it like this. Okay. So here it says that a gear ratio R to S is the ratio of the number of teeth of the two connected gears. So if you take a look at A to B, this one and this one right here, um, the gear ratio R to S is the number of teeth. So it's going to be from 20 to 60. You see that, right? It's 20 to 60, that's the number of teeth, right? So what, what that means is that it's going to be basically the ratio, which is R to S between A to B, would be simply 20 to 60, or if you reduce that, that becomes 1 to 3. Now, keep in mind that that is your R to S, and that is a ratio of the number of teeth. The ratio of the number of revolutions per minute is actually S to R. So what happens is actually you swap them. So if it was 1 to 3 for the ratio of the number of teeth, S to R, in this case, from A to B, would be 3 to 1. So what does that mean? It means that it takes A to rotate 3 times, like this, to for B to rotate just 1 time, like that. So, if gear A rotates 3 times, then gear B rotates 1 time. Now, we're not really interested in finding for gear B, right? We're, we're really interested in finding this gear C part right here. The ratio of the number of teeth for B to C, which is your R to S for the ratio of the number of teeth, would be 60 to 10. In other words, that would be 6 to 1 ratio. And if you do your S to R for B to C, that would become 6 to 1. So if it's 6 to 1 ratio, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So if you swap those, then it will be 1 to 6, right? So here's what's happening. For B to C, B rotates once, where C rotates six times like this. So if you take the entire ratio of all those three together, it will be three to one to six, which means A rotates three times, B rotates once, and the C rotates six times when that happens. So if you take a look at the ratio of A to C, which is now three to six, that just simply becomes one to two ratio for the ratio of the revolutions per minute, right? So here, if you take a look at gear A, gears rotate at a rate of 100 revolutions per minute. What is the number of revolutions per minute for gear C? Well, we know that gear A rotates 100 times, then gear C should be 200 times because we know the ratio has to be 1 to 2. So the answer is going to be C in this particular case. Okay? If you're, if you're confused about this, please let me know. Just let me shoot me another email. So let me move back to the email here. Um, I am going to take the second picture. I'm just going to edit this a little bit because um, you basically took the photo horizontally. Let me go to the photos here. Okay, and I'm just going to edit this. Let's see. Oh, we just do it that way. Okay. So it seems like this is not a um, like a question. I think the question comes from the uh, the other pictures here. It, for the second one, you basically have one method of calculating approximate age in years of the tree um, by a constant called the growth factor. It just describes what the table is. Um, the test should be able to give question class, but I'm still confused about that one. Oh, question 18 corresponds to the picture. So let me just go to the question 18. So we're basically talking about this one here, right? Um, so let me save this picture, save this image, and then go to here, which was this one. And I am going to flip this over. Okay. So now that's done, let me, okay. So I feel like now I can write on this top of this thing. Um, I know it's kind of small to see, but just bear with me here. So it says that if a white birch tree and a pine oak tree each now have a diameter of one foot, 
which of the following will be closest to the difference in inches of their diameters 10 years from now, okay? So 10 years, oh shoot. Um, I'm going to use the pencil. So we're talking about 10 years from now, okay? And they all both have diameter of one foot. So what you have basically here is very, very good. Remember the growth factor times the diameter of the, the tree trunk gives you the approximate age, which basically what you got was 50 and 30. But let me go back um, to this picture that you had before. Remember, we're talking about the white birch tree and, oh shoot, my bad. Um, I think it was this one, right? Okay, so here, if you take a look, it says that the white birch was 5.0 and pine oak tree was 3. So that's what you had for the numbers of those before. So let me go back here and I am going to just write on this top of this thing. Okay, so what that means, right? It doesn't mean that this is equal to 550 or 30 right here. It means those 12 inches times 5 for the white birch those 12 inches times 3 for the pine oak gives you the approximate age. So this guy is approximately 60 years old, whereas compared to this, this is 36 years old. That's what it means. Those three are approximately those many years old right now. So what we're going to do here is says 10 years from now, right? What happens to the, what is the closest difference in inches of their diameters 10 years from now? I am simply going to add 10 to each of those respective ages because after 10 years, we all grow older by 10 years, right? So that's going to be 70 years old, and this is going to be 46 years old. Now, at those respective stage, you're going to go back and say, okay, so for white birch, right? So well, for white birch, it was 70 years old, and that's because it was growth factor of 5 times the current diameter, which is no longer going to be 12. It's not going to be 12 any longer. It's going to, it has grown, right? It's going to be more than 12. And then for the pine oak tree, it's going to be now 46 years old, which is 3 times D. For the same reason, it's no longer going to be 12. It's going to be some new diameter. Uh, it has been grown to a uh, new diameter. So if you do the work, it's D is equal to 70 divided by 5. And if it's uh, D is equal to 46 divided by 3. And if you take those respectively, uh, what is that going to be? 14 point... Or actually, wait, this is exactly going to be 14, which is going to, be, which is going to mean... Uh, that's 14 inches in diameter. The 46, uh, I'm just going to do this the old school way. That's 16. So that's going to be 5, 15, 1, 0. So that's going to be 15.3 approximately. Okay? Obviously, it's going to be 15.333 all the way, but we have those new diameters here. So now it says, what is the difference? You simply subtract the two. What is, I mean, simply, what is 15.3 minus 14? That's 1.3. So it's going to be C. That's how you would solve for the tree question here, okay? So, then that's done right now. I'm going to take this off. Okay, so I think we have, how many questions do we have left to go? We have about, right, three more questions to go here. Let's talk about the triangle problem here. Okay, so for the triangle problem, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at um, in the triangle, RST above point W lies on RT. What is the value of cosine of RSW minus sine of WST? So now I can see that you have done a lot of, lot of work here. I mean, there's like a lot of scribbles here. So it's good that you tried it. And what I can see is you kind of call this point. I don't know if you can see it. I, I can see it on my paper here. You call this one kind of W. This is your handwriting. So I like that. Let's just use that one. And then it says that, you know, RSW means it will be R to S to W, which is this angle right here. And then it will be W, W, S, T would be W, S, oh shoot. Okay, so W, S, T, right? Uh, I'm gonna mark this as red here. Okay, so now let's think about not just what each of these angles are, okay? Do not call these angles and then you try to find these by using a calculator. Um, and then, you know, you, they give you this 12, five, and obviously this one will be then will be 13 in overall, right? Now, a lot of kids just want to like, struggle with this. I can remember two years ago, like a year and a half ago, when a kid took this test and he actually came back and said, what is the answer to this question? Um, you remember, we're talking about in SAT is cosine and sine. And usually, if they give, it, give you in those contexts, what I like you to remember is that sine and cosine are equal to each other. 
What I mean by that is they're equal to each other. And what I mean by that is if I draw a right triangle and if I call this angle X and call this simply three, four, five triangle, right? And remember, I believe you probably have done this in the past or not, I can't really remember. Sine of X will be simply four over five because that's your opposite and this is your hypotenuse. What about cosine of this angle, which we're going to call it a question mark? Cosine of question mark, what is that equal to? That's right, it's already also 4 over 5 because adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So since these two angles are equal to one another, I mean, no, since the sine and cosine value are equal to one another, what can we talk, what can we say about this x plus question mark angle? What is this angle plus this angle, basically? It is always 90 degrees. When the sine and cosine of those two angles are equal to each other, they always add to give you 90 degrees. Now, why am I talking to you about this? It's because I do not want you to focus on these numbers here. Do not look at the numbers. Take a look at this. Take a look at that angle right there, okay? I mean, those two angles, the one that I'm going to mark in red right here, and then the one I'm going to mark in blue right here, if you add those two angles, you see how it was originally 90 degrees, right? So... If I take RSW plus WST, it becomes 90 degrees. What did we just talk about this before? We talked about how if the two angles add to give you 90 degrees, which is X and question mark, and if you take sine of this one of those angles and cosine of the other angle, they give you the exact same thing. So if I say cosine of RSW, I don't know what it is. And frankly, I don't care because I can do sine of WST. And what can I say? That they are equal to one another. Just like how these two are equal to one another, this cosine of RSW, this right here, is going to equal this thing. So if this, whatever it gives me, equals to this thing, and I just simply subtract them. So for example, if this was to turn out to be, I don't know, like uh, triangle over circle, then this turned out to be also be triangle circle, what is it going to be? It's always going to equal being a zero. That's a circle, by the way. It's not a zero. But this is the number zero. It's always going to end up being a zero for this question, okay? All right, so let's move on to the next question here. Whoa, okay. So this question is done. I'm going to discard the changes here. And we have two more to go. What's the next one? We're talking about photocopy machine. Okay, let's write on this. Okay. A photocopy machine is initially loaded with 5,000 sheets of paper. The machine starts to large up and copies at a constant rate. After 20 minutes, it has to use 30% of the paper. Okay. We talk about percentages here, but quite frankly, if you read the second line to third line here, it says the machine starts a large job and copies at a constant rate. Super duper important that we use the word constant rate. What do we think about when we see the word constant rate? Well, we can think about the slope. Okay, every single time the rise over run. Okay, it's like a staircase, right? It goes up by constant rate. It's a line question. If it is a line question, we must think about between A and B. C and D then will be therefore will be out because every every we're talking about we're talking about percentage increase or decrease. It's going to be actually what we call exponential growth or decay. In this case, it will be decay. Now, I just really want to know why you would have put C or why you might have thought that it was going to be C, okay? So it says after 20 minutes, it has used up 30% of the paper. Now, keep in mind that if you use up the 30% of the paper, that just means that you will have 70% of the paper left over. So for example, you start off with a thousand paper. You, after 20 minutes, how many paper are you gonna have? Well, 30% of it is going to be spent. It's going to be used up. So you will have 70% of what you had currently before. So you will actually have 70, I mean 700 paper left over. After again, another 20 minutes, then you will have 70% of that left over. So you will basically have 490. So in this case, C is actually more wrong than D. D would actually make sense because you're taking 70% every time. But what's the problem? This. It's not a constant rate. Every 20 minutes, this from here to here, from this to this, it went down by 300. You basically used up 300 paper. So the next 20 minutes, you should also use up 
300 paper by judging from this description, but it's not. It doesn't go down by 300 pa uh, pages. So this, it doesn't coincide with this portion. That's why it's neither going to be C nor D. So now how do I figure out whether it's going to be between A or B? So simply put in the numbers. We basically start with, oh, I used the 1,000, but it should have been actually 5,000, right? So think about 5,000. So if it's 5,000, the next amount of paper we actually figured out was 70% of that amount, which would give you 3,500. So which of those following, A or B, would give you 3,500 if you, sub if you input M as 20 minutes? Because after 20 minutes, you will have 3,500 sheets of paper, right? So let's see. I think this is going to be just too short, right? Because if you just put 20 here, that, that's going to give you 400. 5,000 minus 400 only gives you 4,600, which is a lot more than uh, this is not the same as this. Therefore, I can only assume then it's going to be B. And lo and behold, if you do 5,000 minus 75 times 20, well, 75 times 20 gives you 1,500 for this portion. So it's 5,000 minus 1,500 gives you 3,500. And look at that. That's exactly the same as this one. So therefore, it's going to be the, the answer is going to be B. Okay? All right. So the last question here. So discard changes. Let's take a look at the last question, which is the mean score of these eight players. So let me just save this in my pictures. I'm going to flip this over. Where is it? Yes. So edit, flipping it over. Okay. And then all right. Okay. So here it says the mean score of eight players in a basketball game was 14.5 points. Now, what that means right there, even just from the first sentence, the mean score of eight players in a basketball game was 14.5 points. What you want to do is you want to draw yourself like eight blanks. And what are these eight, eight blanks represent is like the score of one basketball player, two, three, and you get the idea and so forth and so forth and so forth. But I don't really know what each of the individual scores that they got. And frankly, I don't care because it says that the average was 14.5 points, right? Now, what does this really tell me? It means that if you were to add all these individual score points up, whatever that they may be, and if you divide by 8 because there are 8 players, it gives you the average of 14.5, right? So if you wanted to think about those 8 players in total, that would be 14.5 times 8. Because if you just multiply this side by 8, multiply this side by 8, then the 8 will cancel out. And you will have basically the sum of all these eight players combined, this would be 14.5 times eight, which is what? Zero, four, 32, six, three. So it's gonna give you 116, right? I really hope my math is correct here. Uh, zero, four, yeah, it should be correct. So total would be, it's gonna be 116. That's gonna be the number of points for all those eight players. Now, if you take a look in the second sentence, if the highest individual score is removed. That means we only, so let's assume that this last guy here, that was, he was the best and he was the highest. I am eliminating this guy's score. So I have only seven players. The remaining seven players average mean score of that becomes 12. So what that means is that I draw seven blanks and then the average of those guys was four, uh, uh, 12, right? So if I divide this by seven, like, you know, you add all these guys up and you divide by seven, you get 12. As again, I'm going to multiply by seven on both sides. This becomes 84 now. So if you think about it, the score of those eight players, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then the score of the seven players, if you were to subtract them, you know, like you take the sum of all of these guys minus the sum of all these guys, it basically gives you this last person's score, right? This score was 116. And this score was 84 in total. So if you simply subtract them, it gives you that one person, the final guy's score, which is simply, no, what is that? Uh, two, one. Yeah, so it's going to be 32 points. So there we go. It's simple as that. So whenever they tell you the average and the number of people, it's always just going to be average times, so it's like average times the number of people would give you the total score 
of all those people combined together. Now, I don't really care about each individual scores. I care about the total score because it needs to be constant. Okay? All right. I think that's going to be it. Uh, I think I went over every single thing. The last question was, the last picture was the uh, white birch problem. Okay? So I hope this really helped. And, you know, please don't feel any, you know, yeah, feel free to just send me another email and I'll help you out like this. I think this went really, really well. Um, this is my first time actually doing the video and I hope you kind of enjoyed it a little bit because rather than me just writing everything out, it's just kind of better if I just talk it along with you, okay? So I think I'll see you this uh, Friday. Um, hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you.